So previously in this series, we've gotten a pretty good understanding of how to animate motion using the update procedure. The basic idea of the physics is that we identify what forces are going to act on an object in motion. We sum up all those forces into something called the net force. And then we use the update procedure. First we update the momentum. Momentum is updated by the net force times delta t. And then we update the position. Position is updated by momentum divided by mass times delta t. That delta t is the same window. It's one step in the animation. And we're using the power of a computer to repeat that procedure over and over again until some condition is met, right? In this example, we're looking at while the particle's position is above the uh, is above the, the horizon basically is above y equals zero. You could change this to be time. You could change this to be velocity. You could look at anything you wanted to uh, in terms of the, the while condition for how long it repeats. And you can take this, you can do lots with this. But in terms of learning mechanics, uh, in terms of learning a first semester algebra-based physics course, forces are really only half the story. The other half of the story is energy. So let's take a look at what energy is, how it works. Um, energy is very important because it is a conserved quantity. So this is an example I'm using in my class where we uh, talk about dropping a ball and we want to think about the types of energy that go on here. Well, the first type of energy we're going to think about is kinetic energy. This is the energy associated with something moving. It has an equation. Uh, you use this about half the time. The other half the time you use something very similar for rotational motion, which we'll talk about later. Uh, but kinetic energy, the formula looks a lot like momentum. It's got a mass being multiplied by a velocity. The difference is there's a one half out in front for some calculus reasons that we're not going to worry about. You need this half in order for conservation of energy to work. And instead of it being the velocity vector, it's the magnitude of the velocity squared. So kinetic energy does not care about what direction you are going in. It only cares about how fast you are going. That also means that kinetic energy can't be negative, right? Because a half is positive, mass is positive, and then this magnitude is either positive or zero, right? You can have negative, you can have a zero kinetic energy if you aren't moving, but you can't have negative kinetic energy because none of these things can come out to be negative. If you had a negative kinetic energy, it just, it would not make physical sense. And so we can use that over here in our code. For example, after we calculate here the uh, particle's velocity, we could then calculate the particle's kinetic energy, right? I could calculate particle.ke to be one half times m magnitude of velocity squared. So we'd put in particle.mass, we'd put in times. Now here's a really cool feature. Uh, VPython has a built-in magnitude function. So I can say magnitude of particle.velocity, and then I can take that and square it. And so what I've done here, I've translated the kinetic energy equation into Python. I've got my one half, I've got my particle's mass, I've got my particle's velocity inside of a magnitude function and then square, right? That's following the same order of operations over here. Take the magnitude and square it. Uh, and that's neat that I can calculate that. Of course, if I click run, that new line 20 alone is not going to change anything about what I see in the animation, right? Nothing new appears up here. No new information appears in the printout uh, that we really probably don't need anymore. So let's just comment that piece out. Um, but what I could do would be to graph the kinetic energy. And that requires doing a couple of things. The first thing I need to do is actually create a graph. Uh, let's call this energy graph. And all the graph function does is it tells vPython to set up a window for me to create a graph. So it's going to appear in just a second. We have something here. Then I need to set up my kinetic energy curve on the graph. So we're going to use something called G curve. The idea of the G curve is that it is a graphical curve. It's a thing that appears on the graph itself. So if I use that, if I use G curve here, I can give it a color, color equals color dot, let's say red. 
And then what I need to do is actually add data points to this. So the third step is to come down here inside the loop. After my particle's kinetic energy is calculated, what I'm gonna do is add in ke underscore curve dot plot. And what this command is saying is on that curve, plot a single point. So this is gonna be my time, comma, particle dot ke. All right, so I've got time, I've got particle dot ke. Now when I click run, I end up with a graph. And I can see exactly what's happening to the kinetic energy versus time. I start up at 63 joules, presumably, so we have the units worked out. I get down to a minimum of about 50 joules, and then I go back up, almost reaching 63 again. And you can kind of see how that mirrors the trajectory of the parabola, because we know that the, look at the velocity uh, vector, we know it's getting slower as we go up, but then faster as it falls down. And so we're getting less kinetic energy and then more kinetic energy. Now the name of the game with energy is that energy must be conserved, right? I, I need the total amount of energy to be conserved. In other words, the 63 joules that I start with, that 13 joules that I lose from here to here, that needs to go somewhere. It needs to end up somewhere else in the problem. And the answer for that is gonna be potential energy. Now there's lots of different types of potential energies. Uh, because there's lots of types of forces and every uh, what we call conservative force ends up with a potential energy. We'll talk about non-conservative forces next. But for something like gravity, I can define a potential energy between the ball and the earth. And when we're near the surface of the earth, we can use this approximation MGY. So you notice if you cover up this Y piece, it looks exactly like the formula for the uh, gravitational force. The Y is there because it's an energy instead. It has different units, it behaves differently. And so I can do the same thing here. I can make a PE curve, copy paste, change this. Uh, I better give this a different color and we're gonna give these labels in just a second to actually um, uh, distinguish them. So I now have a KE curve and a PE curve. So what I can do now after I've updated the position is add to my PE curve. So PE underscore curve dot plot. It's the same practice as up here, T comma, and now I need my potential energy. Oh, I should probably calculate the potential energy too. So let's say particle dot PE going to equal, uh, what's this going to be? Particle dot mass times, uh, what did we call G? We called it grav up here times particle dot pause dot y. You notice I'm only interested in the y component of the position here because we're only interested in how high it goes. Also, energy is a scalar. I cannot have any vectors in here. So my particle dot pause, I need to pull out one coordinate or one component from here. So to make this a scalar here, I'm using a component. To make this a scalar up here, I'm using the magnitude function just based on whatever the formula needs. All right, so we call that particle dot PE. So again, KE curve going to be in red, PE curve going to be in black. Let's click run. So I have a red curve for the kinetic energy, a black curve for the potential energy. And what I notice is that as my kinetic energy decreases, my potential energy increases, and vice versa, when my kinetic energy starts increasing again, my potential energy decreases again, because my total energy needs to be conserved. The total amount needs to stay at the 63 at the beginning. And if you want to, if you want to watch this in slow motion, you can really keep track of how these two values at every point in time always add up to that initial 63 joules. And now to have proper scientific documentation here, I can also add labels to this graph. Uh, I've added in the energy graph function here an X title and a Y title so that I can show my time on the horizontal axis and my energy on the vertical axis. I've also labeled my curves here. So I have a label for kinetic energy, a label for potential energy. Those are important because you want somebody else to be able to look at your graph and understand what's going on without you having to explain it. And so those uh, axis titles and those labels are very important. Now, I made the claim that this thing needs to have the total energy conserved, that it needs to have the total amount of energy be constant. And so what I can also do is make something called a total energy curve. So let's do the same procedure here. Let's copy this and paste it. Uh, let's see, this is the total. Why don't we make this green since we are <laughs> conserving energy? So uh, that, that's not what, the, those are different uses of the term energy conservation, but it's kind of a funny pun. Um, let's see, we got total energy there. And now to plot my total energy here, 
I could calculate the, uh, I could calculate or I can just add it, right? So I could just take this piece here and just say, uh, what's this gonna be? This is gonna be total E curve dot plot and add together the potential energy plus the kinetic energy. There we go. Uh, so I click run on this, I'll now have three graphs. I've got my kinetic in red, my potential in black, and my total in green. And that total is pretty flat. So as long as this thing is pretty flat, I've got pretty good confidence that the energy is being conserved. Now I mentioned the term conservative force earlier because yes, as long as you don't have anything reaching into your system, as long as you don't have anything reaching in and stealing some energy away between the ball and the earth, then what we say is that the network being done is zero. But not every force behaves that way. Particularly, the drag force does not behave that way. Now, I snuck in before I started this video and I turned off the drag force by setting drag coefficient equal to zero. But let's watch what happens to this energy graph when we add back in our drag coefficient. Okay, so like we saw before, the trajectory is more or less the same. My kinetic energy also decreases and then uh, it kind of starts to increase. You can already see how this is changing because my potential energy goes up and then down, right? That, that's definitely not going to change. My kinetic energy decreases and then it really doesn't increase a whole lot. In fact, it stays right around this, what is it, about 27? It creeps up a little bit here because it's getting a little bit faster. But what you notice has happened is that my total energy has decreased. Well, the question always has to be where did the energy go? And the answer is it's gone into the environment. The, the drag force, the air resistance, the atmosphere that we're now modeling has stolen some of our energy, right? Because as I think about uh, those air particles interacting with the ball, they are now getting some additional kinetic energy outside of the system that we were working with earlier. And so what I need to do is I need a way to keep track of this. And that's where this last piece comes in, the work. Energy conservation in general states that the change in energy inside a system, so between the ball and the earth, needs to equal the work done by or on the surroundings. So the surroundings in this case is the atmosphere, so I need to calculate this work. Well, the way you calculate work, let's go down here to calculate the drag force. The way you calculate the work done by the drag force is you take the drag force and you dot it with how far the thing moves. So I actually need to put this further down here. So let's go cut and paste down here. So the amount of work done is the dot product between the drag and how much the particle moved by. So particle.pause doesn't tell me that, it tells me the current position. The delta r, the amount it changes by, is this little combination right here. So what I want to do is take the dot product between my drag force, here let me get a little bit more space here, I want to take the dot product between my drag force and my delta r here. So these are both vectors because momentum is a vector and drag is a vector. So I can take the dot product between those two to get out the amount of work done by the drag. Now I also want to think about how much work has been done in total because if I just calculate this piece, this is going to be how much work the drag force did in this one loop of the animation. Think of this as like a as like a delta W. Well, I know what to do with deltas. I add them up. So what I need to do up here is start with my work done by drag equal to zero before the loop. And then during the loop, I'm going to add to that amount this dot product each time. So this thing is going to keep getting larger and larger. So I can add one more piece here. Oops, copy, not cut, paste. I can make a work curve. Let's see, we've got red, black, and green. Let's make this one blue, and we'll label this the work done by drag. And then of course I need to do the same thing over here. Uh, we call it a work curve. So after we calculate work drag, let's do work curve dot plot, and then we'll do time comma work done by drag. Cool, so now I'm keeping track of three individual types of energy and a total energy. And let's see what happens when we add the work into this consideration now. So when I think about the work done by the drag, I'm thinking about the work that it does on the system. And since it is robbing energy from the system, it is 
uh, it's a negative energy, right? And that's the exact amount that this green curve is decreasing by. So you see how this green curve is decreasing the exact same amount in parallel with the blue curve because the amount that the kinetic and potential energy together lose needs to be the amount that the drag is taking away, right? This is what we mean when we say the energy has to go somewhere, that any amount of energy that changes needs to equal the amount of work done. Well, that's exactly what we have here. We've got this delta E here equals my work being done by the drag force here. And it really makes sense for this to be negative always, because remember, this is a dot product, right? And dot products are negative when things point in the opposite direction. And we know, we designed it this way, that the drag force always points opposite of the momentum, right? Drag force always points opposite of the velocity. Velocity always points in the same direction as the momentum. So it's guaranteed to work no matter what I do, right? I could increase this thing's, um, let's say I increase this thing's uh, launch speed here. Let's say I launch it farther vertically. Right, that's still going to encounter drag. And so the, the details change, right? The numbers on the axes change, but the pattern remains the same because drag is still acting. It's still stealing my energy from my system. Drag is never going to put energy back in my system. So this thing is always going to be negative and it's always going to be uh, increasing in size. In fact, you can see here uh, something really cool happens that we have a really drastic amount of work being done then not a whole lot of work being done and then more work being done because it's not moving as fast up there at the top, which is really cool to look at. So anyway, that's an example of how you can uh, work with energy in your vPython code. And so if you are transitioning from forces to energy, this is a really great way to get a handle on how energy changes in an animated moving system.